Uh, we are ready to get started. Welcome to all that are joining in. Nice to have you with us this afternoon. Okay. So we are ready to start. Good afternoon and welcome to this side event. And a very special welcome to those joining us on the webcast. The title of this session is Linking Local to Global, Intersectionality as a Driver for an Inclusive Loss and Damage Fund. This event will discuss how to ensure that women and marginal groups benefit from the Loss and Damage Fund. My name is Vivian Atakos. I am engagement policy and advocacy expert. I work with the CGIR Gender Impact Platform. And uh, thank you once again for joining us for this an hour and a quarter this afternoon. We hope you'll find this session as stimulating as possible and we encourage you to engage with us during the question and answer session. In terms of the format of the event, we will hear uh, a keynote presentation and then we'll get into, uh, we'll hear two presentations, then we'll take a and a session after which we are going to go into um, a discussion on the tools that are available for the marginal groups that we are uh, talking about to make use of so that they can be able to access the loss and damage fund. And finally, we'll move into a panel discussion. So again, to introduce you to this event, uh, COP27 closed with a breakthrough agreement to provide loss and damage funding for vulnerable countries hard hit by floods, droughts, and other climate disasters. For those of you who are at COP, I can imagine that that, was, that made the headlines, so it was quite a significant agreement. But for us here in the room and those of us joining online, how can we make sure that women, the elderly, youth, and other marginalized groups benefit from such funding? So towards this end, the African Women Development and Communication Network, FEMNET, together with the CGIAR, International Food Policy Research Institute, uh, organized this uh, session so that we can discuss further. We are going to hear about the institutions, tools, and actions that are needed to ensure that support reaches the most vulnerable populations. So we'll get right started right away. And to my left, uh, the left hand of honor, we have um, Oyewole Simon Ogini. He is with the Center for Development Research. He is best here in Bonn. Uh, he has worked a lot on conflict, uh, the intersection of conflict and climate change. And he has a lot of work uh, studying the lectured basin. Uh, Oyewole is best here in Bonn, and I wish to welcome him to give us a presentation on the discussions, the status of discussions on the loss and damage fund. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Um, I'm happy to be here again, and I, I know that uh, we all reflect on what happened. Uh, for instance, when weather changed, some people have a coping me mechanism and those, some don't have that. So uh, when we reflect on what has happened recently, we could look at what happened in Turkey in the recent time. And you see the loss of uh, lives and livelihood. And, 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 and you could see a lot of donation from different international community. Uh, although this was not enough, but that's to show you uh, how, how important it is uh, to, to really uh, take more seriously the, the loss and damage fund uh, for climate uh, uh, change uh, risk-related uh, events. And not only that, if you move across Africa, uh, and I think uh, more recently it's, it's quite interesting that uh, the effect of climate change is so prominent that Ukraine, who has been in conflict, had to really step in and provide us some, you know, a support in terms of grain uh, to some of the uh, communities that could not really take care of themselves because of the adverse effects of climate change. Uh, it is very quite important that the, the COP27 uh, made a significant progress uh, on loss and damage funds 
almost a day was dedicated uh, to that, and that is commentable uh, if you look at it in, in the history of 27 years of discussion on climate change. So I feel like it's an important moment, yet uh, progress uh, uh, yet to be made in significant area. We talk about adaptation, we talk about mitigation, even though these are always uh, lumped together uh, when it comes to finance, international finance of uh, climate change. But I think we need to connect science uh, to policy and to engage the local community to understand in their own way uh, what the effect of climate change means to them. In this context, we have to take uh, cognizance of the indigenous people who actually are at the verge of uh, extinction in terms of livelihood, uh, even their culture as a result of uh, climate change. Personally, I work in the Lake Chad Basin. The Lake Chad Basin region provides uh, uh, a source of livelihood to over 40 million population. A population that is uh, more than uh, some country in this part of the world. And yet, the between 1960 up to now, we have almost a 90% 90, 90 shrinking uh, you know, of the lake due to effect of climate change. High temperature increase uh, by 2 degrees Celsius uh, more recently. And not only that, this also drives quite a lot of indigenous people who base their life on livelihood, on agriculture from that area as a result of droughts and evaporation of water evaporation and also unsustainable use. This creates conflicts. Conflict in the sense that people have to move from where their life are based for several years to another place to source, uh, you know, to source for another livelihood. And with the new place where they are going to is not automatic. It's a place where they meet also other vulnerable people. And this creates conflict. So the conflict in those areas and many other places in the Sahel region is overlapping, not only because of the surgencies of harm group, which also is more connected to livelihood of the young people who could not provide for themselves, who could not, you know, uh, continue to live the way they want to realize their dream as other people across the world. And as a result of that, they were recruited because they do not have alternative livelihood. So these are cross-cutting issues and also emphasize the need to take more seriously the loss and damage fund. Um, if you look at it uh, from the other uh, African perspective, Africa needs almost $3 billion annually up to 2030 in order for them to really adjust to the threat of climate change. Developed world has a lot to play in terms of charging those who, which activities on sustainable practice that are more connected and costly to our environment. Uh, I would like to stop here, but uh, I will want to say that how can loss and damage from be effective? There is no other way than to address the root cause. We have to address the root cause of climate change. We have to make unsustainable practice very costly. And this is very important that when we adopt this kind of tools, then we can diversify by taxing unsustainable practice, divert the resources to those who are vulnerable, and not just vulnerable, but mapping, adopt the science, the tools, to map who are the vulnerable within the vulnerable. So we have different category of vulnerable people. So this is uh, quite important. Uh, maybe I, I can also emphasize that there are several tools which need to be adopted, adapted to the context. For instance, if you talk about social protection, the social protection could be much more relevant for the elderly people. The elderly people who could no longer, you know, have the same strength to continue, like for instance, people affected by droughts, whose livelihood has depended on agriculture and not just agriculture, traditional agricultural practice, and they are of age. These people will not be able to work like young people, but the social protection could actually, uh, you know, compensate for this and make them to, to stick, be counted among uh, uh, the people across the world. Um, there are also other tools which 
us to be provided, not only by the developed world, but even the countries need to establish these contingency funds. I think uh, this, for political reason, I will not going to mention that, but this have quite a lot uh, uh, with the Turkey uh, disaster issue that happened in terms of what contingency fund mean. The compensation for natural disasters, how much this uh, is implemented. Um, I would like to mention this, uh, uh, which is very important, women. Women specifically are more vulnerable uh, when it comes to the effect of climate change. In Sahel region, they have to take longer time to fetch water. They have to take walk distance to look for water for everyday use. This takes their time and take them away from the economy activities. Some young children or young uh, women who have to move distance also are exposed to a lot of risk as a result of this. I invite you uh, to, to visit this part of the region that have been really affected and we will really uh, appreciate uh, the need to really take seriously loss and damage fund. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Oyewole, and thank you to my audience for appreciating uh, his contribution to this discussion. Um, he has actually raised very important issues, and he went ahead to uh, speak about various tools that we need to adopt and adapt to the context. So as a communicator, I'm just highlighting those because those of us tweeting, if you're on social media, these are good tweets. So he also said that we need to address the root cause of those who are vulnerable within the vulnerable. So within that vulnerable group, find the most vulnerable. And since funds are limited, then we start with those that are most affected. So thank you very much. We'll give you an opportunity to come and ask a few questions to Oyeole when we move into the Q&A session. But for now, I want to welcome uh, my panelists to the extreme left. Uh, Muzna Alvi. Muzna Alvi works with the CGIAR uh, International Food Policy Research Institute. She's based out of India. She's a research fellow with the National Natural Resources and Resilience Unit, and her research interests span from studying the relationship between ethical and social identity and its effects on economic, education, and employment outcomes, particularly for women. She holds a PhD and an MA in economics from Michigan State University and an MPhil in economics uh, from Jawaharlal um, Nehru University. Uh, she's going to speak to us right now on IFPRI and some of the CG findings on strengthening women's benefit streams from climate action. You're welcome, Muzna. can hear me, right? Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Vivian, for that introduction. And I'm, I'm very happy to follow um, Simon's presentation because I think he brought in great examples from sub-Saharan Africa. And I'll be speaking to my experience in uh, the South Asia region. Um, so what I'll be talking about is, well, I guess I should get right into it, uh, on why we should be paying attention to gender in resilience programming. And I'll draw on some of the research that uh, my colleagues at IFPRI and CGIR broadly have done. Um, we all know that there couldn't be a more urgent time to focus attention on gender inequalities in the food systems uh, and strive to make food systems more just and equitable. Uh, in the 2011 FAO Status of Women in Agriculture report, um, key uh, gaps in agriculture Culture, including gaps in access to resources, finance, credit, and other agriculture services were highlighted. Um, and the report also emphasized the instrumental value of uh, closing gender gaps in agriculture. Um, the estimate was that if we could close the gaps, gender gaps in agriculture, uh, and if women had the access, same access to resources as men, we could reduce the number of hungry people in the world by 12 to 17 percent, which is a significant uh, number. Um, and, and these have sort of also complementary benefits. So apart from improving nutrition, health, and human capital, um, other well-being outcomes also improve when women have more control over um, income and our women are more empowered. 
Um, so, you know, we are, we are facing this multiple crisis. There is the climate crisis. We are still reeling from the economic um, and health shocks of COVID-19. Uh, there's the food price crisis that has followed Russia's uh, war in Ukraine and then conflict, uh, which Simon spoke about, um, both sort of as a consequence of climate change, but also um, um, other, other causes. Um, to help illustrate the ways in which resilience is gendered, I'd like to draw upon the gender, climate, and nutrition framework. Uh, GCAN is a large project that uh, CGIR and IFPRI are, are doing, um, supported by USAID. Um, and the framework shows how the impact of climate shocks and stressors are filtered uh, through several elements, including the level of exposure and sensitivity to the disturbance, the existing level of adaptation capacity, um, and the decision-making context which influences the response choice and then eventually what are the responses uh, that, that, that people actually take. Uh, so multiple levels of um, uh, mediation that, that, that uh, determines how, uh, how people respond to the exposure and, and at every level, you know, these, these responses are gendered. Um, so addressing gender inequalities in agri-food systems is not only important because we care about gender inequality, uh, but there is instrumental value. It makes economic sense to invest in women and in, inclus in closing the gender gap. Um, uh, there has been a marked shift uh, in, the, in the discourse on not just looking at women as victims of climate change, uh, but also as important agents of change. Now, women perform activities in the food systems that have broader implications for climate resilience. Just to give you some examples, uh, women are more likely to manage poultry and small ruminants and small livestock, uh, which has implications for income diversity following shocks. Uh, women uh, managed plots are also more likely to have diversity of, of crops um, that has implications again for resilience capacity. Um, many there are uh, there are documented cases of women adopting more innovative food storage and processing practices that helps in smoothening when shocks happen. Um, and then perhaps most importantly, women rely extensively on social networks. Uh, while it can be um, and I'll talk about how sort of excessive reliance on social networks is, uh, could be an issue, but also, you know, in, in, in cases um, when, when shocks happen, when formal uh, sources of information or formal sources of extension or resources are not able to reach uh, the most vulnerable, women's economic, uh, sorry, social networks are, are quite important in, in sort of uh, in, in their adaptive capacity. So like I said, it makes economic sense to focus um, on women. Um, so what are some promising approaches to address uh, and, or reduce gender inequality through climate action? Uh, some of these uh, that I discuss here are more supported by evidence than others. There are other promising approaches that deserve uh, further study, both sort of more qual qualitative evaluation of what the mechanisms of change are, as well as sort of more quantitative evidence on uh, what the impacts will be. Uh, there's evidence that shows that social protection programs, um, and, and Simon also mentioned those like food and cash transfers or public works and school school feeding programs can increase the economic opportunities for women, increase their assets, and reduce the need for maladaptive coping pra uh, practices. Our own research at IFPRI has shown that uh, when women receive social protection or cash transfers, for example, along with some behavioral change communication, it has downstream impacts on things like reducing intimate partner violence, even though that was not the goal of the uh, uh, cash transfer to begin with. Uh, similarly, uh, there's evidence coming out of India that shows that girls who had benefited or women who had benefited from school feeding programs when they were girls are more likely to have better health outcomes now as well as their children are also likely to have better health outcomes. So um, there are sort of broader gains to be had from investing in social protection programs um, and design features like adding environmental conditions could support broader environmental goals. So an example of such a program is the Bolsa Verde in Brazil. Another promising approach for which there is almost overwhelming um, uh, evidence is the is climate action or collective climate action through group-based approaches. Uh, women's groups, um, we know now, um, are shown to increase women's access to services, including information and credit, and they provide an imp important platform for women's collective agencies. There is both sort of qualitative evidence as well as case studies from countries like India and Kenya that shows that uh, women who are part of self-help groups 
have greater civic engagement, are more likely to be politically active. Um, we also know from some evidence in South Asia that women who belong to self-help groups, again, have uh, greater participation in community uh, negotiations for public goods, um, uh, make better agricultural practices. Um, and I think the best part is that uh, there is now a rich legacy of these self-help groups in several parts of the world, and they provide a ready platform on which other programs could be leveraged and layered. Uh, one, when, one, I guess, big transformative um, impact of these self-help groups has been in changing norms around women's mobility and the acceptance of women's um, participation in, in sort of civic negotiation. I think, uh, and again, my evidence is sort of relatively anecdotal, but I've spoken to other colleagues who also work with self-help groups. Um, and there's greater acceptance among men for women's mobility and women's engagement when they are part of self-help groups. So that has that, that sort of has a big transformational um, a scope uh, and, and a platform that should be leveraged to um, to implement climate action. Um, another promising area that relates to gender is the gender sensitive design and dissemination of information. Uh, we tend to focus a lot on sort of technocratic approaches that looks at improving access to technology uh, or new tools, mechanization, new seeds. But I think we forget that there is a fundamental barrier, which is access to information. We have to let people know that these these services exist or these, these uh, uh, subsidies exist, these technologies exist. Um, and so we have some evidence that shows that women ha when women have um, access to extension services uh, and when extension services are better reaching women farmers, uh, that agriculture performance improves and the negative impact of weather variability and climate shocks um, is also reduced. Um, I'm part of sort of ongoing work that's looking at how we can leverage innovative ICT technologies uh, to better reach women farmers in India, Kenya, and Uganda. One word of caution on that, though, is that, uh, again, we always try, even, even when we're talking about ag extension, we tend to focus on these um, tech-led and digital approaches. Uh, but there remains a big uh, digital gender divide, and that's nowhere in the world is as stark as it is in South Asia. Uh, so we should be careful that we are not sort of using um, technology that... Uh, uh, that that actually intensifies the already existing gaps. Uh, and so I think what we advocate for is a more digital approach, which is uh, physical sort of face-to-face -face extension that uses digital platforms to strengthen uh, communication. Um, so I think there's a need to invest in sort of um, ag extension system, and, and, and there's perhaps no replacement for formal ag extension systems that are government-led, particularly in times of crisis. Um, there is some research on how to make gender finance more gender responsive um, and how to better integrate gender into climate policies and investments. Um, a lot of our financing that already exists is predicated on having ownership of land or being able to document proof that you uh, you have access to and own land. Uh, and that precludes a large amount of women who don't have formal access to or ownership of land. So how can we design finance that allows us to either use collateral free financing or use other means of collateral, such as group-based lending, um, that uh, that can be used for climate financing. Um, of course, there is, you know, so the larger question of increasing the representation of women organizations in in policy processes and promoting women's leadership. Um, and uh, more recent studies emphasize the importance of sort of large multi-sectoral programs. So we need, as Simon mentioned, dedicated gender funding and dedicated funding for uh, marginalized groups, and particularly women from these marginalized groups. You know, we now have evidence from South Asia that women belong to disadvantaged caste groups or, or relatively disadvantaged ethnic groups are much more likely to uh, uh, face climate crisis and have much less access to resources to um, to adapt uh, to to climate shocks. Uh, so these are just some things that that uh, hold promise. Um, I just want to end by saying that CJR is preparing to launch an innovative uh, innovation sprint on gender and climate ahead of COP28, um, and the aim is to inc uh, to have an increase in aggregate self-financed investments from NGO partners um, and to also achieve positive outcomes and proactive outputs in agriculture, climate smart ag, and food systems to be completed in a sort of relatively short, expedited uh, time frame. Uh, we are trying to leverage our ongoing work of one CGR portfolio of initiatives, including HerPlus, the Gender Impact Flat Platform, the Climate Impact Platform, and other CGR programs, including the Gender Climate and Nutrition Initiative. So I invite you all to join us in this, in this endeavor, and I also encourage you to attend other sessions that CGR is organizing through the next 10 days. Yeah, thank you so much.
Great. Thank you, Muzna, for such a rich uh, presentation, coupled with excellent examples uh, based on your work in India. And also um, adding um, more info to what uh, Oyewale said. So I really appreciate the two of you for bringing that out. And I also want to mention that you brought in the issue of innovative ICT technologies uh, as part of the examples. And I did notice that um, the UN uh, Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, did bring it up during the Commission on the Status of Women in March in New York. And his exact words were, if women are not at the forefront of even doing the programming and the coding, then we will still uh, be limited in terms of how far these ICT technologies reach out to women. So he was sort of encouraging, yes, as much as we are encouraging them to make use of the ICT technologies, but we also need to make sure that during the coding and all that goes on behind there, that we take care of their needs, so in terms of the algorithm. So I just thought to mention that because it sort of um, ties into this discussion, sort of they build on to each other. Okay, so at that point, um, that's where I want to in invite some audience interaction from the two of you. We have had two presentations so far, and I want to give you at least three minutes so that you can ask us a few questions before we move on to the next presenters. Do we have any who would like to ask either Simon or Mosna a few questions? based on what you've had. Okay, any others so that I take them together? All right, I see two hands, so we'll take two hands, then we'll move on with the conversation. We'll start with, um, you will introduce yourself and then ask your question. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Genevieve. I'm here from the University of Eastern Finland. And thank you both very much for your presentations. I found them both very fascinating. Um, I actually had a question uh, for um, Musna Alvi. Uh, thank you, by the way. The examples that you gave were fascinating. Um, do you have any further examples of how you can um, make more gender-inclusive finance? I really liked the example that you brought um, at the point that you brought of uh, land ownership being a prerequisite for accessing climate finance, um, because that's like a really solid example of something that, that for me is very um, elusive sometimes, gender-inclusive finance. So do you have any other examples of um, ways that uh, finance can be, more, uh, can be made more gender-inclusive? Thank you. Should I respond? Great. Um, we can take the next question. Okay. Yeah, thanks very much for both your presentations. They were great. My name is Debbie Aller. I'm from Cornell University, and I work with an agricultural extension. So I was really, really, my question is focused to you, Musna. Um, and I was curious more in your experiences within Southeast Asia, um, is there anything being done around women-led learning circles um, where women can teach women farmers? Um, because I know this is something that's been very effective in other parts of the world. So I was just curious if you had any kind of input on that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you both for the question. I'll respond to yours first on climate inclusive financing. Um, I would love to know what the solution is. Unfortunately, there aren't very many examples of where this has been uh, implemented successfully. Um, in India, we, they, we are beginning to have this conversation about how to delink finance from land ownership. So the Reserve Bank of India has this large flagship scheme called the Kisan Credit Card, where farmers apply for credit to formal banks and are given, you know, so not microfinance because so not not those sort of oppressive high interest rates, but formal finance uh, where they're given a preloaded credit card that they can only use at sort of government approved input shops. Uh, there are now discussions on how to sort of both digitize that process so that it makes it easier for women to apply because often these uh, administrative bottlenecks prevent uh, people from applying, uh, but also finding ways in which uh, group-based lending or group-based liability can be leveraged to give access to women to this formal credit um, within a sort of already existing large flagship scheme. Um, so, I mean, 
adopting some principles of microfinance, but not exactly, sort of using some of those principles of joint liability, but uh, linking women to uh, large financial networks. So I think we have a lot of examples in South Asia where uh, women's self-help groups have, have effectively kind of negotiated to be able to access finance for agriculture purposes. I don't have very many examples of where that's been done for sort of more climate smart agriculture, for example, or, or with a focus on climate. Um, on, on your question, I... I, actually, there are some very excellent examples from South Asia on how women-led, um, you know, information circles are working. We work very closely with the Self-Employed Women's Association, which is a large trade union of about 2 million women who are engaged in informal trade um, or are self-employed. So this includes women who are working in urban areas as rack pickers, uh, working with waste uh, recycling as domestic helpers, as well as an extensive network of women who are working in rural areas. Um, and they have really, uh, I think, mastered the, the sort of concept of women-led extension. So they have, um, I guess, frontline workers, you could call them, in each village where Seva gives out information to these frontline workers and they then disseminate it into uh, the villages in which they work. Some states are experimenting with this frontline worker approach, which has been very successful in South Asia and in parts of Ethiopia and Kenya for health services. Uh, so these frontline workers who are hired from within the community to give health information to um, pregnant women, young mothers, and promote infant and young child uh, feeding practices, using that same platform but adopting it for agriculture and livestock. So we have some examples of what they call Krishi Sakhis, which are friends of farmers, women who are hired um, and uh, trained by the government to be frontline workers to give information to other women on ag practices. Similarly, we have Pashu Sakhis, which are friends of livestock. Again, similar concept, trained to give basic health um, and uh, um, basic health services for livestock and poultry, uh, women to women. And because these are women who are drawn from within the community, there is a greater acceptance of the information they're giving. This, it's more readily accepted. It reduces the need for women to kind of have to travel to, you know, for example, get uh, deworming medicine for for their goats. It's readily accessible within the village and you're getting the information from someone you you, you help, you rely on. So there are these these platforms that are now being used, yes. You had you answered the second question yes. to me? Oh, good. <laughs> All right, thank you. So thank you for those two questions. I really appreciate um, you asking uh, Muzna those questions. So let us move on. Uh, we want to move on to the second part of this discussion. And here we are looking at the various tools uh, that are available. And to take us through this session, we have two of my speakers. I have Marisa Hutchinson, and I also have uh, Thomas Falk. Uh, we will again listen to them and then move on to a Q&A session. So I will introduce Marisa. She's also to my left, just next to Muzna. Uh, Marisa is a Caribbean feminist from Barbados, currently located in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. She is the Environmental Justice Program Officer with the organization International Women's Rights Action Watch, Asia Pacific. Uh, she works to spotlight the intersection of climate change and human rights. Marisa is also a member of the Women and Gender Constituency Facilitative Committee. She's going to speak to us on measures to increase women's leadership in climate action. You're welcome. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I will try not to go over time like everyone. Um, thank you for having me on this panel and thank you to everyone here. Um, so speaking about key measures to increase women's leadership, um, so from my work and experience, uh, we are located in Malaysia, but we work very broadly with the Global South. Uh, one of our key measures that we use is in terms of capacity and knowledge enhancement and not building, because what we do believe is that these women on the ground are the experts of their experiences. So why are we trying to build their capacity when they already have it? So in terms of how we can enhance it and enhance it in a way that we put them or we create, uh, I guess, like activities and modules which can amplify their voices and put them into spaces that they can utilize to raise their own voices regarding their issues. And one of those spaces being the UNFCCC, but our organization, ERAW, well, the acronym, we, we make it ERAW AP. We work very closely with a UN mechanism known as CEDAW, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women and Girls. Um, what we realize in the work that we do is that often women are unaware of their rights. 
they're unaware of how policies work or unaware of how policies exclude them, but they do know. They do understand it is um, exclusive, but in terms of how we use concepts and different, um, yeah, basically concepts, it doesn't really account for the real experiences of women on the ground. Um, so in a lot of our work, we try to promote a very like feminist or into, I guess, more like a global feminist agenda in which we first, again, enhance the capacity of women, whether it's true, um, more specifically, like what is environmental degradation and climate change, and it um, using some of the concepts or teaching in some of the concepts of loss and damage, um, mitigation, adaptation, because again, we all know that these women are, le women are left out of these processes um, because if they come into a UN space, they're unaware of what is being talked about because their reality is very different. So they know they're having drought, um, they're not getting water for plants, the plants aren't growing, et cetera, but they don't know the conceptualized way in which we define it. Um, which, again, leaves them out of the conversation, often left out of different discussions and discourse, et cetera. Um, so in building their capacity, how we do it, and I'm glad that you raised like, women learning circles, le yeah, what we deem them as as women leader learning circles. Um, and we realize that in a lot of these communities, especially women-led communities or women communities in which there are um, um, proportionately more women in this case, that women have the leadership skills, but they're just not deemed as leadership skills. So we use it in a way that it empowers women. And I mean, they're already empowered. They do a lot on their own, but in terms of forefronting that they can be empowered and that they can lead in their own way. So we do more so women learning circles or women learning spaces in which um, a lot of groups. So one specific project that I work on in the Mekong region is no, the other thing is the issue of language barrier and then the digital divide that you mentioned in terms of how women can engage and effectively. So what we did in this process was to nominate women leaders. And these women were willing and empowered enough to take on that position in terms of learning and then use that as a way to teach other women within their communities and girls. And again, their, the capacity is there, but we just enhance it. And then they move forward with the kind of concept that we consider reach one, teach one, which is useful in many cases. And I know I might be speaking specifically to capacity building. There's also the opportunity for community research, um, but this is research led by communities, not outsiders coming in and doing research and exploiting and extracting information from communities. And then at the end of the day, communities are unaware of what is put out there because oftentimes we create documents and materials that are inaccessible to communities, not just because of the internet, but also because most communities won't have computers to access um, flash drives, or there are some cases where we don't think about the liter sorry, literacy of communities, and it isn't because there weren't schooled, et cetera, but in the way that we write our reports and our materials, they do not identify with the lived realities of communities on the ground. Um, so in terms of, again, the capacity building, that supports them in terms of how they do their own research. Because, again, they're the experts. They know what is happening. They know how to present it, et cetera. So why not continue to use measures and um, different, I guess, tools and processes that include these women and girls? Thank you. I hope I didn't go over time. <laughs> no, you didn't go. Uh, over time and you gave us a minute. So thank you very much for that. Uh, let's move on then. Uh, by the way, I liked your approach on the reach one, teach one. Was that it? Yeah, I think it, it really uh, is a good way to spread the innovations and reach the women. Okay, so to my right, I have Thomas. Uh, Thomas Falk is with the CGIAR, International Food Policy Research Institute. He's based here in Germany. He's going to talk to us about a climate change metric to measure national progress in climate action. Remember, for this particular segment, we are looking at some of the tools that we can apply. So I will introduce him. He is a research fellow in the Natural Resources and Resilience Unit and an institutional economist by specialization. Thomas has done extensive research on natural resource governments, 
governance in the global south. He has worked in the fields of economics, of natural resource management, multi-level governance in social ecological systems, science policy interactions, and transdisciplinarity. His recent work focuses on conceptualizing and supporting behavioral change in system transformation processes. You're welcome, Thomas. Thank you very much. Can you please make, yes, thank you very much. Yeah, now I would like to share some thoughts and ideas about how we can support decision and policy makers in taking gender equity and inclusion more strongly into account when um, implementing the loss and damage fund. Um, yes, um, so what, what is the underlying motivation? First of all, we, we see a great potential that uh, preferential access to the loss and damage fund can support, in particular, most vulnerable groups, um, women and, um, and other marginalized groups. And we see a great risk that, that if um, the, the fund is implemented in a gender-blind way, we, we deepen um, the gender gap, we create um, yeah, additional, um, um, or we, we reduce in additional ways the, the climate resilience and food security in particular of, of vulnerable groups. And um, we are aware that there are a lot of instruments out which guide how to reach uh, women and marginalized groups, but very often we, we think they are not very accessible to decision makers and policy makers, not easy to use. And um, as such, we, we try to um, invest um, some of our resources in developing metrics and indicators which um, enable countries to make progress in supporting most vulnerable groups. Um, so uh, the previous uh, speakers have already talked a lot about why, why this matters. Um, and um, of course, in particular, rural women are, are specifically uh, vulnerable to climate risk, to climate-induced um, um, extreme events, and that has structural reasons. Um, land tenure was mentioned before. Often it's the question of what kind of the quality of the land, what kind of land they, they use, um, issues of... Um, um, yeah, they are responsible for providing resources to the households which are um, more prone to, to climate risks. And um, if an area is hit by an extreme event, then usually um, they are more, more stuck for different um, social, cultural, and economic reasons at the, at the place of the disaster, while men have more opportunities to, to move away and search for alternative livelihoods. And um, on top of that, um, we are also well aware that um, shocks and stresses um, increase the, the incidence of gender-based um, um, violence, um, which is also true for, for climate-related um, extreme events. Um, so in, then adding another dimension to the, to the uh, um, risk, um, looking at the exposure in particular, um, we, we can see that if we want to reach, in particular, women, um, we, we need to be more aware of where are they most active, what, what are their activities, where, where can they best be reached. And we see that this is different between sectors and between geographies. And some of our studies have shown that, um, for instance, in Bangladesh and in Pakistan, women spend more of their time on livestock-related activities um, compared to men, while um, in, in Mali and Zambia, um, this was true for uh, cereal production. So women were more active in, in cereal production. And if we if we now add um, the the third dimension of uh, of risk, the the hazard, so the likelihood that um, somebody will experience um, um, a climate induced uh, extreme event, um, then we can see. Um, or we can we can map actually 
where the, the climate agriculture gender inequality hotspots are, and um, we find them in particular in large parts of Africa and in South Asia. Now, taking this further, Musna mentioned already the um, Gender Climate Change and Nutrition Integration Initiative. Um, so USAID uh, requested the CGAR, in particular IFPRI and partners, to develop national scorecards to support scorecards to support gender responsive and nutrition sensitive monitoring of climate policies and investments. So the, the idea is to, to prioritize and document achievements and, and gaps, achievements and gaps of loss and damage funding as, as one example, um, also of other policy instruments, but uh, it's in particular also applicable to the loss and damage funding, um, and make this measurable at the national and, and even the subnational scale. And this contributes, of course, very much to, to transparency, to, to showing that achievements have been met, which um, create and also incentives for the countries to uh, to um, make investments reducing vulnerability of, um, of women and other marginalized groups. And um, something which has been mentioned also already before, we, we cannot only talk about the affected um, group of people. Um, it's, it's very essential that we also involve them in the development of the approaches and the tools. So this is something which is deeply embedded in the initiative. Um, women across different positions and uh, decision-making and power are involved in, in this process. So maybe, um, it, yeah, we would be uh, very curious to hear also from from you, from from our audience, um, what kind of um, factors, what kind of um, um, aspects you think um, should be included in um, yeah, generating such a metrics? What kind of indicators could be relevant for um, yeah, documenting um, the and, um, and vulnerability of, of women and marginalized groups? Thank you. Great. Thank you, Thomas, for those insights. And with that, we come to the end of that session of uh, just uh, listening to some of the presentations from our speakers. I would like to give you an opportunity, but probably let's do it at the end because we have one more speaker. And Lou is going to come in, but during a panel uh, discussion, which we will move right into because of... Uh, time. So um, Lou is going to come in together with uh, Musna, Marisa, and Simon, and I will keep you here, so <laughs> feel free to participate um, with those additional insights, even from the work you've shared on the metrics. So because we have already heard from the other speakers, allow me to introduce Lou. So Lou Vachot, who's to the, my extreme right, is a principal scientist and also leader of the land restoration group at uh, SIAT and um, Mitigate Plus. He'll tell us what SIAT means. I'll, I'll tell you what that means. <laughs> anyway, he works on forestry and agriculture issues with a climate change focus and co-leads the Severe Amazonia Initiative, bringing NASA satellite technology to Amazonian decision makers to help them address deforestation, uh, drought, fire, and economic development. Uh, he has His group works in the highlands of Kenya and Ethiopia to restore productivity to degraded landscapes and raise the standard of living for rural farmers. It will interest you to note that he has worked on the IPCC since 2003 and is a lead author on the landmark 2019 special report on climate change and land. So, Lou... Welcome. Let's hear from you. Uh, I'll start off this discussion from you. Let's hear from you about climate change and mitigation. Yep. No, thank you very much, and, and, and thank, thank you very much for inviting me here as well. Um, so Mitigate Plus is the Low Emissions Food Systems um, uh, program of, uh, initiative of the, the CGIR, um, and we're, we're working on uh, looking for uh, – it, it's a development agenda, but focused on, on lowering emissions in food systems for uh, particularly middle-income countries or soon-to-be middle-income countries, so countries that are ready to take on some mitigation um, types of activities in their, in their development programs. Um, I'd like to just pick up on a number of points that have been raised so far. I mean, we, we've said that, that women are 
um, particularly vulnerable to climate change. Climate change is a risk or a vulnerability multiplier, right? It leads to increased conflict, and in conflict you get increased exploitation of women and youth. You get uh, you know, uh, human trafficking, sexual trafficking, things, you know, all, uh, some of these things. Um, and, and women typically survive crises less well than men do. And so there's a, a long list, and this is nothing new, this is, and this is universal. It, it happens in developed economies, it happens in developing economies. Um, just to, to cite some examples, the 1991 cyclone in Bangladesh, 90% of the deaths were women. The, 20, uh, the 2003 French heat wave, more women than men died. In Hurricane Katrina, women and children were disproportionately affected. So developed and developing countries, this is uh, uh, the situation. Women are more likely to suffer from malnutrition, which also puts them more vulnerable in a more vulnerable position at the start of a crisis. Um, so so, the, this is, so we, we've talked about this, and, and I think that recognizing that this is not just a developing country issue, but this is a universal issue, I think is, is, is helpful. Now, when we talk about mitigation, um, there, there are a number of, of, there are a lot of equity issues that come up, right? Who bears the cost and who reaps the benefits? And if you listen to the discussions that are out there, there are a lot of, of discourses that are happening. So there's, of course, the, the merit-based discourse. You know, the, the people who should benefit the most are the people who have contributed the most. You know, so if you've taken more actions, you, you, you have larger land, and you're doing more things on your land, you should get the benefits. This is one way of, of, of looking at things. Right? So, so benefits should be proportional to your contributions and to your inputs. There's also a needs-based approach. You know, those who are more needy should be benefit. We should, be, you know, mitigation finance, climate finance should benefit the poorest of the poor more than the people who are, you know, who are the, the wealthy landowners who are actually asking to do different things with their land. Right? There's an egalitarian. Women and men should benefit equally. Right? But then, what do you do with the the disproportionate um, risks of of of, um, uh, on, of climate and climate impacts on, on women? There's a bit the libertarian perspective, you know, legal rights. You, you, you know, if you own land, you own areas that, 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 that carbon is being sequestered on or, or, or that we're changing practices on, then, then that's the, the, your entitlement to, um, to, to the benefits of this. You're also expected to bear the costs, right? And there's a steward um, uh, uh discourse. You know, we should be actually benefiting groups and, and, and communities that have been good stewards of their lands, that haven't deforested, that haven't degraded their soils, that, ha that aren't do doing a, a intensive agriculture that's producing a, a lot of, of greenhouse gas emissions. So I think we need to understand you know, that all these discourses are out there, and there are many different ways that people understand equity, and we actually need to find ways through the, these conversations and, and understand that, that discourses represent power structures and, and, and promote different points of view and different interests. Um, and this is not to say that, that, that there's a, the judgment here on which discourse is right and which discourse is wrong, but these are legitimate, perceived as legitimate points of views of different stakeholders in the discussions. And if you're going to negotiate through and find a way through to, to, um, uh, to, to, to an equitable outcomes, to equitable distributions of cost, equitable distributions of, 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 um, of benefits, you're going to need to deal with different stakeholders' perceptions of where they sit within the, 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 the contributing to the cost or contributing to the, or, or being, having claim to the benefits of this. Um, along these lines, I want to pick up a little bit on this, um, this idea of uh, climate finance and land ownership that, that was brought up, right? And we have a very if you, if you look at the way our, our, our climate funds are set up, it's a very Western view of nuclear family and uh, land ownership type of, of things. And this is not the way traditional societies structure themselves. And I think we need to realize this. Laura German has done a lot of work on this in, in Africa. She's written a lot about traditional land tenure systems, matrilineal systems, patrilineal systems. Patrilineal systems, the sons inherit Daughters in families have access to land temporarily, but once they're married, they, they then get access to land through their, their husband's patriline. Land does not belong to individuals. It belongs to the patriline or it belongs to the matriline. And in the matriline is typically the, 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 the matriarch's brother, the maternal uncle that, does, that is responsible for the distribution of land. The, and, and this is not universal, but, but these, this is a very typical sort of, of situation in Africa. And this creates very strong relationships between brothers and sisters, sometimes stronger relationships than between husbands and wives. Right? And similarly in patrilineal 
systems. And, and in a patrilineal system, divorce sometimes results in the woman leaving the patriline where she is and coming back to her original one. And sometimes she retains land within her patriline until her death, and then it reverts to the patriline. Likewise in matrilineal systems. If we put in fee simple land ownership in systems like this, in a matrilineal system, if you give fee simple ownership to a son, you've just taken land away from women and vice versa. We need to understand that these systems have built-in protections that, that are not consistent with our understanding of land ownership in, in, in uh, the way we've structured Western sort of, of um, uh, financial me mechanisms. And is it really for traditional science societies to disrupt their own systems with their own built-in protections in order to take advantage of these? So I think we need to, to understand that you know, the disruptive nature of, of traditional societies and, and move away from this idea that, that you know, traditional land uh, ownership disfavors women. And we need to actually understand the under, true underlying power structures in these systems to understand what is, is really happening and, and, and how women are protected or not in systems and how we are likely to disrupt it. The idea behind, behind this land ownership has also been put forward by if people have land, then they can raise finance for it. They can increase their agricultural productivity. The evidence from that is not there. There is no evidence that owning your land allows you to increase your productivity. Okay? So I think we need to start to undo some of these things as, as, as we think about trying to ramp up climate finance for mitigation, for adaptation, for, for carbon sequestration, and, and, and try and see how can we fit these mechanisms into the traditional structures, recognize that these traditional structures still have a lot of role to play in these societies and that these societies are not ready to, to give them up. And even if you force it upon them, you're going to enforce greater conflict. There's also, no, there's also a lot of evidence that land ownership increases conflict because whose right claims do you honor through the ownership? So I think we need to be a little bit, pay a little bit of attention to these as, as we put together climate finance. So these are just some, some, some quick off-the-cuff remarks, and hopefully this stimulates a, a bit of a conversation. But I really, if, if you're interested in this at all, Laura German has done, written from the University of Georgia has written some really nice things about this. She, was, she worked at uh, ECRAF in, in the uh, Alternative Slash and, or the um, uh, African Highlands Initiative. She was at C4 for a while, and now she's at the University of, of Georgia at Athens. Um, and, I, and I think she's probably the leading thinker on, on some of these things and, and understands best how these, these types of systems function in way and how they're likely to be perturbed by some of the solutions that we are proposing. Thank you. Thank you, Lou. And indeed, that's a reality check because you are actually telling us what the data is showing from your research uh, on issues to do with land, productivity, and what we need to be focusing on. So thank you very much for uh, that additional insight. I want to come back to Simon uh, to see whether he has any remarks following what Lou has said, probably from your work in Chad. Do you have any additional um, anything that has come up just listening to Lou. Yeah, thank you very much, Lou. Very fantastic. Uh, I think uh, you, you just speak my mind on, on social structure. Social structure is, is quite important uh, when it comes to how we administer climate change uh, funding and how effective it could be. Uh, I mean, I'm sure your work in Ethiopia and, uh, and Kenya will provide this, this uh, reality check. And it's the same in the lecture, the Sahel region, you know, access to land, who owns the land, the social structure, the social norms that define it. But I want to uh, much more emphasize on this course because I think this course really defines what problem is and what is risk and opportunities. I think it's, it's important for us to reflect deeply on, on the discourse of climate change HF. I just want to say something. I was in, uh, at, the, at the verge of the lake chat, and I met some farmers, and I was asking them what's the problem. I said, you know what? We don't understand what climate change is, and we have no idea what you're talking about, but all we know is that sometimes it rains, sometimes it doesn't rain this year, and we, we, we have to shift our farming period, and so we have to follow through this discussion to understand, and we come to discussion, and through their local language, they emphasize climate change, actually. So 
how do we communicate this to the people? How do they understand it? And this is also very important. So that is why I appreciate your comment on the um, discourses on Western idea of what land tenure system is. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Marisa, anything at the top of your mind, even as we move on to the Q&A? Um, not particularly. Again, mm -hmm. going back to what um, Lou said and also... I may not call your name correctly, so I won't call it. Um, but yes, in terms of, again, creating the discourse, but again, as I said, building the capacity of women and marginalized groups in terms of, well, specifically in the case of what Lou said, in terms of what is land rights, who has access to land rights, but also how the process works. So like kind of building their knowledge on policy and how policies work and what is in place, but also to structural and structures and systems that are already there, um, I think that would be useful in cases like this. Thank you. Oh, Moving on to my further left, Musna. No, I mean, uh, again, nothing, nothing new to add. I think uh, Lou's observation about these traditional systems of land ownership was very interesting, uh, and which is why when I mentioned, you know, sort of innovative methods of climate finance, of course, we need to ensure that women have ownership of land, but we also need to ensure that any benefits shouldn't necessarily be linked to land ownership and can we find ways that, that you know, sort of de-links um, subsidies and benefits and access to services from, from land ownership. So I think, I think that's, that's quite important. And I guess I also want to stress on the need for more standardized monitoring systems and data. Um, I think uh, that we have so many organizations working on, on sort of these gender transformative strategies um, very broadly, but focused also on, on agriculture, but we don't have standardized systems of monitoring uh, what where, where impacts are. Um, and we are living in sort of, uh, we are fortunate to be living in a world where we have access to so many standardized tools and measures. Uh, I want to make a plug for the Women's Empowerment in Agriculture Index, which is a flagship CGIR project, uh, which covers various aspects of uh, women's agency, both instrumental agency, collective agency, and intrinsic agency. Um, it's a tool that has been validated over the last 10 years, used extensively around the world, um, and I think um, provides a very nice way to sort of track progress in, on empowerment over time. Um, so, yeah, I just want to make a pitch for better data. Yeah. Okay, great. So let's come back to my audience in the last 11 minutes of this conversation. Do we have any who want to come in and ask any of my speakers to clarify an area or any question? I see your hand, Priscilla, but it's hidden. <laughs> okay. There's a microphone. There's a microphone, especially for the online audience. Yeah. I'm Priscilla Chakwa from Women Environmental Program Nigeria. And thank you very much. At least I came late, but I listened to the last panelists and, of course, the interventions of others. My question is that um, how do we do innovative financing for rural women farmers? because that's a critical aspect. And most of the times when we talk about financing, we leave out the issues of innovative financing for rural women who have a lot of challenges in assessing finance for agriculture, but also looking at the issues of specifically agriculture. Mm -hmm. The second question has to do with infra infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, I come from a country where we have a lot of challenges when it comes to infrastructure. And of course, uh, the issues of post-harvest losses, especially for the rural women, is something that needs to be handled. And so when we talk about issues of agriculture and of course food systems, food system transformation or pathways, how do we address these issues? Because these are very critical issues. And if we have to link them to land system tenor, um, it's, it's, even get, it's even worse because um, land is something that is very political and as we all know, uh, it's a resource that uh, most of the governments will not let go. For instance, in my country, the land art system, I mean the land arts use was 
I mean, was reviewed since 1978. Up to today, it has not been reviewed. And so, and that land act you stated says that all land are vested in the government, which is held in trust for the people. What does that trust mean? At any point in time, the government can take the land away from you. And then when you talk about community lands, that is where we have the huge issue. The women cannot have access, even for farming. So how do we address these issues? Even for leasing, sometimes you say you want to lease, and when they see that you are, you are, I mean, your farm or whatever produce is becoming very recruitive, that is where the people now realize that, oh, no, this is my land, I have to take it back. How do we deal with these issues? Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, do we have others? We have about eight minutes. <laughs> any easier ones? Okay, we have one. Do we have any others in the room? Okay, let's take that one. Oh, okay, and then you can come after. I can't promise if it's easier, but um, I have a question on data um, because this has come up a couple of times in this panel, but also other panels. And um, I work for a feminist NGO. And for example, every time we apply for funding that we want to do uh, something on data, we want to do research, but we want to do it in an intersectional way because I uh, live and I'm based in Germany. So if we would, for example, do data on women, that would encapture mostly white women. So, um, But we have, for example, cases uh, of environmental racism going on in Germany against uh, Sinti and Roma. So that, like, you get my point. It, do, it, it doesn't capture the people. It should actually, um, uh, it should actually capture. So, um, and, and it's like a vicious cycle because uh, whenever as like a feminist and critical organization, we go to policymakers and ask for something. It's like, well, you need to data, you need the data to prove it. But whenever we want to do the data, it's like you're not scientific enough. This is not uh, this is not um, proper knowledge production. You need like this and that report. So I think it's more of, it's like an intervention, but also a question of how to tackle that because we cannot provide the data if um, uh, we increasingly have knowledge on intersectionality, but the funding structures and the structures in conferences like these don't move along with us uh, with that language um, b because they still focus on like traditional uh, knowledge production that is very white, very male, very conservative. Thank you. And you are? Oh, sorry. Uh, my name is Sheena Anderson. I work for the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy. Okay. Thanks, Sheena. Um, yeah. Um, uh, thank you for a brilliant presentation for all f of you. Um, uh, my name is Ahmed. I'm living in Germany. I'm student in Master International Migration and Intercultural Relations. Um, my questions, um, I just want to know how to get information in uh, the people the local persons in South uh, Global or in developed countries, um, um, especially when the, this local persons, these peoples, they have several different problems in, in the society. They are, they are already vulnerable. It could be because of the war or the economic crisis. So in my perceptions, if I talking with them about the topic climate change, they said uh, we have uh, we have enough problems. Mm. Um, so th th there is a gap information on knowledge uh, between two sectors, as a global global north and global south. Um, the people they live in climate change, but they don't consider it. They don't see that. So um, the question is, how get the information to convince these people um, they are now in risk? An endangered situation. Thank you. Okay, I realize we just have like five minutes. Lou, do you want to take the difficult question? Mm -hmm. <laughs> how do we do sustainable finance? Uh, that's. Um, I think we're we're learning how not to, in many cases. Um, I think we we are. Um, I, I think what what I'm trying what I was trying to say in my intervention was that. We actually have to recognize that there are different ways that societies and people organize themselves 
and we actually have to find ways to fit into those ways that they organize themselves and, and recognize that if we force them to change to our system, we actually may be imposing unintended damage on them. You know, we've all seen development projects. You know, Noel Kempf was supposed to be this great Red Plus project that was supposed to, to produce all these social benefits, and it, it's really fallen short. It's been a technocratic sort of, of, of project, and, 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 but it hasn't generated the development benefits. We've all seen investments in, in different types of things. Large-scale land acquisitions right now is a big thing, right? And everybody's doing free prior the process and not really on the substance, right? So, so we've done the consultations. We've done this and that. But have we gotten meaningful um, uh, consent or, or not? And, and, you know, what level – can I even answer the question, what level is dissent something that actually kills a project, right? So, so I, I think that we need to – I think we have some, some good principles. I think we understand enough in different corners of, of, of – um, the knowledge system, the knowledge ecosystem around this, I think we need to be, start putting some pieces together and actually put some things on their feet that, that, that demonstrate ways to do it um, that maybe are a little bit alternative and, and experimental. So, so I think that, um, I don't think we have the, the full answer at the moment, but I think we have enough reasonably good hypotheses to start testing them and, and to, to try them out. And there again, we get back to the data collection. You know, you have to collect data and validate. You know, everybody does series of change. But a theory of change is actually a hypothesis of change. And if you never collect the data and test your theory, you really don't know if it works or not, right? So, so you have to go beyond just the, the beyond, beyond that. So, um, and and I, I know that doesn't do all the justice to, to the hard questions, but I, I think that many people are struggling with these. So, so mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you, Lou. Thomas, I told you I'd find something for you. Mm. <laughs> you want to take the second question? Oh, oh, oh good. Data. Um, I... I feel tempted to to add a little bit to to Lou's response to the question on the on the financing. Um, an important part, in my opinion, is is also to to well understand what are the structural barriers which prevent uh, the women really to access the the finance, and and then be very careful, as as you said, um, using the the classical blueprint solutions um, and trying to push them um, in a context which, which maybe doesn't fit. And um, I think the Mitigate Plus um, um, initiative um, shows a way, even if we don't address primarily finance, um, to, to address issues like this by, by having deeply embedded this co-creation idea. We're bringing these different actors really together and developing from their perspective, solutions to, to the issues we have there. Okay, but uh, my task was to respond to the sustainable uh, to, to, to the financing question. I mean, it is it is definitely um, a common bias which which we observe, and um, uh, I mean we can only encourage you to to uh, um, advocate with the donors that uh, this this is an important requirement. We see developments for sure. I mean, there, there is currently a, a call out um, um, where um, a consortium of um, research funders um, from different countries, um, it's, it's um, led by, by the Canadian NFRF, um, really encouraged um, to build transdisciplinary consortia, um, deeply embedding um, um, also um, civil society into the consortium um, creating this, this co-creation um, environment um, across the sectors, across disciplines. Um, and um, I think we, we just need to all raise very loudly that we need more of these opportunities. Great. Thank you. I hope you have gotten something. <laughs> Marisa, yeah? Oh, Priscilla. It was Priscilla. Okay. Oh, all right. So final question. You had one. Anyone who would like to respond to him? On my left hand. Yes. Okay. I think basically what you are trying to say is, a, is about risk perception, you know, like uh, how people who the other people see as in danger do not see themselves as in danger. I hope I communicate what you mean. So the point is, yes, there's a need for science communication to reflect, for instance, the reality of indigenous people. You know, indigenous, we talk about indigenous knowledge. They are very unique. And that also goes to the question on land tenure, on innovative way. What we call innovative might not be innovative. Mm. 
So innovation has to really be contextualized. You know, if a group of women gather and establish themselves for microfinance, the ability to assess fund to achieve a particular goal could be called innovative. So far, they achieved this goal. And then if it becomes sustainable and it could help others, that would be more significant. So this is the idea of what we call innovative, what we call climate change, how can we localize it? This is the problem, uh, one of the challenges with the COP27 on the agreement on the loss and damage fund. We are yet to operationalize localize this, and this is one of the important presentations. Thomas represented on, on the metrics. It's, it's one of the ways to go about it. We have to do this, but that does not mean the metric will, is just to serve as a basis upon which we had, but we still have to contextualize it. Mm -hmm. So this is very important. So in the contextualization, in the localization, understanding will come, this discourse, the knowledge will come, and people will be able to embrace the reality, and we can reflect this and relate it translocally, nationally, and, and this is how it works. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Simon. And that is where we started, and that's where I'd like to end this discussion. Um, we have looked at... Um, the loss and damage fund and just try to find entry points for ensuring that it's as inclusive as possible. Uh, Thomas started us off by giving us the status of um, the, that particular fund and gave us examples from the work going on in the Chad Basin. We had uh, Musna who came in and um, talked about various ways. She mentioned a couple of tools and ways that we can ensure women benefit. Uh, 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 we, we strengthen women's benefit streams from climate action. Uh, towards the end, she brought in the Women Empowerment in Agriculture Index. So we need to ensure that whatever we are doing, are the women really getting empowered? And there are various tools that you can measure whether empowerment is really happening from the various interventions. We moved on to Thomas. And um, uh, we moved on to Marisa. Marisa shared about their work and how what they are doing to increase women's leadership in climate action. She talked about various capacity building initiatives, including the Rich One, Rich All, Rich One? Each One, Rich, rich One. one. <laughs> yes, I like that a lot, and I keep referencing back. Finally, we had, um, not finally, um, we had Thomas come in, giving us a metric. He gave us very uh, good reasons and the rationale for measuring progress in climate action. Uh, before Lou came in, you remember his very uh, um, excellent presentation and a key question that is still at the back of my mind even as we talk about this fund is who bears the cost and who benefits the most? That's a question that we still need to ask ourselves. And so at that point, that is where we want to end this discussion. I want to mention to you that we do have... Um, a conference. It's called uh, From Research to Impact Towards Just and Resilient Agri-Food Systems. This conference is coming up in New Delhi, India. It's going to be in October. The call for contributions. Feel free to uh, probably have a look, probably do a Google search. You'll see the conference. It's another excellent opportunity for you to come and interact with the researchers that you see here, together with policymakers that are working on issues to do with uh, women, youth, and climate action. So again, that particular conference happens in New Delhi. It's an annual conference, and we welcome all of you to engage in it. With that, I am Viviana Takos. I've been your moderator for this event. Thank you very much for your active participation. Thank you.